وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ And do not send away those people who call upon their Lord. When do they call upon their Lord? بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ In the morning and the afternoon. لَا تَطْرُدِ تَطْرُد is from the root letters طَرَدَال And طَد is to throw or push someone far away from oneself. It is to throw or push something or someone far away from oneself, thinking it to be useless, insignificant. So just imagine if there is something very filthy, something that's very dirty, or something that's completely useless, what do you do? Just throw it away. Just push it away. Like, get away from me. Go away. So basically it is to repel someone harshly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu over here. لا تطرد Don't send them away. Don't repel them. Don't drive them away. Don't chase them away. Don't dismiss them. Who? Those people who call upon their Lord all the time. Dua over here refers to dua mas'ala. Meaning, making dua to Allah, asking Him for something. And dua over here also refers to dua of ibadah. Meaning, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for example, salat. So those people who make dua to Allah morning and evening. Those people who are worshipping Allah morning and evening. Such people, don't send them away. Instead, befriend them. Keep them your companions. Be in their company. Don't leave them. Because they remember Allah in the morning and in the evening. The word ghadat is from the root letters ghayn dal waw. And it's used for awwalun nahar, for the beginning of the day, the first part of the day. And ashi is from the root letters ayn shin ya. And ashi is used for the evening time, basically, from after the sun begins to decline from the meridian, so basically after zuhur until night time or until the night is over. This is what ashi refers to evening time. This is one opinion. Others say that no, this is only the time of Maghrib and Isha. Others say that it's the end part of the day. However, Ghadat is morning, Ashi is evening. However you want to take it. So they pray to their Lord morning and evening. Why? Yuriduna wajahu. Seeking His face. Meaning, through their ibadah, they want to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to see the face of Allah in the hereafter. They want to please Allah. And they want to see His face in the hereafter. They don't want to be deprived from it in the hereafter. مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ You, O Prophet wasallam, are not responsible for their hisab of anything. حِسَابِهِمْ Them. Who does them refer to? The mushrikeen. Them over here refers to the mushrikeen. Imam Muslim, he recorded in his Sahih that Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, he said, there was a group of six of us with the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, six of the believers with the Prophet ﷺ. And the idolater said, tell these people to leave so that they will not offend us. Meaning, if you want us to come and listen to you and believe in you, then you have to tell these people, these six individuals to go. Because we don't like to sit in the same place that they are sitting in. Why? Because of their worldly status. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he said, There was myself, Ibn Mas'ud, a man from Hudayl, Bilal, and two other men whose names I have forgotten. So the Prophet ﷺ, he thought to himself, perhaps that if he sends these believers away, then what's going to happen? These mushrikeen are going to come. And because they are very influential people, if they become Muslim, then everything will be fine. So temporarily, let me ignore the Muslims. And obviously for any person, thinking that if my action is going to prevent others from believing, then I will be held accountable. So over here, the Prophet ﷺ is being told that if you don't leave the company of these righteous people, and as a result of that, these mushrikeen don't bother to come and listen to you, then you're not responsible for their disbelief. 
You're not responsible for their disbelief. ما عليك من حسابهم من شيء. They are responsible because you have your doors open to them. It's they who are so arrogant that they cannot sit with those people who are lesser than them in the dunya. You're not responsible. ما عليك من حسابهم من شيء. Because when somebody tells you that I will only listen to you when you leave them, I will only do what you're asking me to do when you ignore the other person, when you don't give them their haq. Then you wonder, okay, maybe I should leave the other person so that they will come because I'm responsible to guide them as well. I'm responsible to help them as well. And you feel guilty. Over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you don't need to feel guilty because مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And you are not responsible for them in any way. Meaning every person is responsible for himself. فَتَطَرُدَهُمْ So you drive them away. Over here this is connected with لَا تَطْرُدْ Meaning if you drive them away فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Then you would be of those who do wrong. You would be of those who are unjust, who are unfair. How? That you would be depriving those people who are interested in the deen. Who are true believers, who are honest believers. For the sake of who? For the sake of some proud people who are not going to believe anyway. So what do we learn from this ayah? First of all, about the prohibition of leaving the company of the righteous. About the prohibition of sending away those people who are righteous. Those people who come to learn the deen. And they sincerely want to learn the deen. What do we learn from this ayah? We're not allowed to send them away. We're not allowed to send them away. لا تطرد Don't send them away. Secondly, we learn from this ayah about the importance of righteous company. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, keep yourself in the company of such people. Don't send them away. Don't send them away at all. Stay with them. Because it's possible that some other time would have been given to them. Like people do. You come to me at this time, and you come to me at this time. So the poor believers, you come to me in the morning, and the mushrikeen, you have my special exclusive session with you in the evening. No, it wasn't like that. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was told to keep the company of the righteous people throughout the day, all the time. So if these mushrikeen don't want to come, don't worry about them. In Surah Al-Kahf, Ayah 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطًا And keep yourself patient by being with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and the evening, seeking His pleasure, seeking His face, seeking His countenance. And let not your eyes pass beyond them, desiring adornments of the worldly life. And do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance and who follows his desire and whose affair is ever in neglect. If we think of it, who do we sit with? Who do we like to talk to? Who attracts us? People who have taqwa and iman are those people who appear to be very wealthy, who appear to be very impressive, who have the glamour of this world. A person who does not like the needy, a person who looks down upon them, he doesn't have iman in his heart. Remember that. A person who looks down on others who are lesser than him, he does not have iman. Because when iman enters the heart of a person, he loves all those who have iman, regardless of their race, regardless of their age, their color, their background, whatsoever. The only quality that will attract him to the other is Iman. That's it. It's not money. It's not the way they dress up. It's not the way they speak. It's not their race. It's not their beauty. No, it's Iman. Which is why, what do we learn? 
that if a woman is proposed by a man who may have a lot of money, who may have a lot of glamour of this world, then what should she go for? The deen. Why? Because the deen is the most important thing. Iman is the most important thing. Everything else can change. Everything else can change. But if iman changes, then that's a big problem. So what you need is iman. And if a person has iman, then you should like them because they have iman. What do we learn in the Quran? So many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Why? Because iman is the most beautiful quality in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a person could have. People have many qualities. But the quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses by is iman. Because it's the most beloved quality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this takes us to the next lesson that a person who has iman, he should not shun who? Those who have iman just because of their worldly status. Just because of their worldly status. He should not shun others just because of their worldly status. Rather he should stay with them. Why? Because of their iman. We also learn from this ayah that a person is not going to be held accountable for the deeds of others. He is going to be responsible for himself. This shows to us a very important thing that how eager the Prophet ﷺ was to convey the message to the people. And remember this is the last of the Makki surahs. I mean it was revealed towards the end of the Makki period. So this shows how eager he was for them to believe. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, don't leave these believers for the sake of these mushrikeen. No matter how much you want them to believe. And the Prophet ﷺ is being told to keep in the company of righteous people. Why? Because righteous company affects a person. If the Prophet ﷺ is being told, then what about us? Why do we think that if we stay with those people who are not that righteous, you know, we're too strong and we can protect ourselves. We're not that weak. We are weak. We are weak. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to make sure we stay in righteous company. وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ And thus we have tried some of them through others. Meaning, we try people, we test people through other people. Some people become a fitna for others. A source of their misguidance, a source of their straying. Because the poor Muslims, they became a fitna for who? For the rich mushrikeen. But they would say, we're not going to come and sit with these people. We're not going to come stand next to them. Sit in the same gathering that they're sitting. This is what? A fitna. So, وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people through others. لِيَقُولُوا So that they say, who says? The rich ones say, the shurafa, the noble ones, they say, أَهَاُلَاءِ Is it these people, meaning is it these poor people, whom مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا Whom Allah has shown favor to from among us. Meaning He has favored them with iman. So if these people have iman, then I'm not accepting iman. Do you understand? So they became a fitna for them. أَهَاُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا Allah says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ does Allah not know very well about those who are grateful? Meaning Allah knows who to give the tawfiq of iman to. Yes, these people are poor. Yes, they were slaves. Yes, they may not be that beautiful. But they are shakirin. Therefore, Allah gave them tawfiq to have iman and He didn't give it to you. Allah knows who deserves what. And we as people have no right to object at the decision of Allah. To say, how come this has been given to this person? And this is extreme arrogance. Extreme arrogance that a person objects at the decision of Allah and he says, was it only this person who was left? أَهَاُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, that people are what? 
a fitna for who? One another. People are tested by other people. I could have said that I am going to test you and I am going to test through you. That I am going to put you to trial and I am going to put others in trial through you. So we as people are tested through tests that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are also tested through people. Man becomes a test for man. People become a test for other people. It could be your relatives. For a person it could be their cousin, it could be their uncle, it could be their grandmother, it could be their grandfather, it could be their mother, it could be their children, it could be their in-laws, it could be anyone. It could be friends, it could be teachers, it could be the boss, it could be the co-worker. People are a test for others. Secondly, we also learn from this ayah that majority of those people who respond to the call of the messenger are who? Those who are poor and weak. And we see this with many messengers. For example, the Nuh alayhi salam who believed? It was the poorer people. Which is why we learn that the people said to him, وَمَا نَرَاكَ تَبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَادِلُنَا بَادِي الرَّأِي Nor do we see any follow you but the meekest among us. Meaning those people who are aradil. They are the lowest amongst us. They are the ones who are following you. And for example, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ as well, who became Muslim first? I mean initially. It was mainly the poorer ones, the slaves. And we learned that Heraclius, who was the emperor of Rome, he asked Abu Sufyan that do the noblemen or the weak among people follow him? Meaning, who follows Muhammad ﷺ? Is it the noblemen or is it the weak ones? Abu Sufyan replied, rather the weak among them. Heraclius said, such is the case with followers of the messengers. Because the weak people, they know how to sacrifice. And the rich people, they have made this dunya paradise for them. And whatever the messenger is telling them, it goes against their desire. So why would they submit? Why would they accept? وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا And when those come to you, O Prophet ﷺ, which people? Those people who يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا who believe in our verses. When the believers come to you, regardless of their appearance, regardless of their worldly status, what should you say? فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Then say, peace be upon you. What's the usual norm? That when somebody comes from outside, they say a salam to the one who is inside. But over here, the Prophet ﷺ is being told that when they come to you, you say salam to them. You greet them. And you say, that كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ that your Lord has prescribed mercy upon Himself. Meaning He has made mercy mandatory on Himself. Which is why when a person, no matter what he has committed, no matter what sin he has committed, when he turns to Allah at the right time, then Allah forgives him. Because Allah has prescribed mercy upon Himself. Annahu, indeed He. Man amila minkum su'an. Whoever among you commits a su action, an evil action. How? Bijahalatin, because of ignorance. What does it mean by bijahalatin? That first of all, a person had no idea that that was something wrong. Or secondly, jahala, forgetfulness, or being overcome by emotion. Like we learned yesterday, فَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ Don't be of those who are ignorant. Was it that the Prophet ﷺ did not know sabr is important? Of course he did. But when a person, despite knowing he doesn't do amal on it because of being overcome by emotion, then it is as though he is ignorant. So what is this jahala referring to? That first of all, literally a person does not know. And secondly, because of being overcome by emotion, he forgets temporarily. 
And therefore, as a result of that, he does that which is su. Summa taba. Then he repented. Bin ba'dihi. After it. Meaning after committing that su out of ignorance. Wa aslaha. And he also did islah. Meaning he didn't go back to the crime again. He changes his ways. فَإِنَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. What do we learn from this ayah? First of all, that when we see believers, whether we know them or we don't know them, whether we like them or we don't like them, whether they are rich or they are poor, whether they are very famous or they are infamous, or they're unknown, no matter who they are, just because they're a believer, what should we do? Say salam to them. Because the Prophet ﷺ is being told that when they come to you, say salam to them. Generally, what is our behavior? When we go to a gathering, when we go to a wedding, when we go to a party, who do we greet? Those people whom we know. Or those people who are very famous. And people who... We've never seen them before. We don't know who they are. Or they're dressed up in a very awkward manner. We don't even look at them. We pretend as if they don't even exist. But what do we learn? That no matter who they are, no matter how they appear, you know they're a Muslim. Say salam to them. Greet them. Because كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ If Allah is so merciful, that he continues to give people. He gave guidance to a person regardless of his race, regardless of his status. Then don't you have mercy for other believers that when you say them at least say salam? Sometimes we say, oh this person has done something very wrong. And because I'm very upset with them, that's why I'm not even going to say salam to them. But if Allah is so merciful that despite their wrong action, Allah is constantly giving them risk, then shouldn't we have mercy and greet them? Are we more fair than Allah? Are we more just than Allah? No, we're not. So no matter who that believer is, it is our obligation that we must greet them. Don't ignore them. Don't just walk past them and think that they're non-existent. And sometimes we see that people don't even introduce their family members whom they don't like or whom they don't get along with or who are lesser in status. They pretend as if they don't even exist. They're going in the same gathering together. But they will sit away from them as if there is no relation between them. They will not introduce them. They will not even talk to them so that they are not known by them at all. Secondly, we learn from this ayah that we should give good news to the people as well instead of just only warning them. Because over here, tell them that كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Tell them Allah is so merciful. What do we say? What is our approach generally? If you don't believe, there is hellfire. If you don't do this, there is severe punishment. Yes, give the warning. But also give good news. Especially people who are struggling so much. Remember this is a Makki surah. The Sahaba, they were struggling so much. So much. And imagine if they're struggling to keep their iman, they're suffering from so much opposition, and when they come, they're being reproached all the time. Imagine how they must have felt. Just imagine. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told that when they come to you, say something nice to them. Say something good to them. Say positive words to them. Hopeful words to them. So that they become happy. Thirdly, we also learn from this, that every disobedient person is ignorant, even if he's very educated. Disobedient person, a person who disobeys, he is doing what? Jahala. He is in Jahala. No matter how educated he is. And if he does not know how to be obedient to Allah, then his knowledge is not going to benefit him. So at the end of the day, we shouldn't be concerned about how much we have learnt we should be concerned about how much we have practiced, how much we have implemented. Because if we don't implement that knowledge, then it's as good as we are ignorant. 
وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ And thus do we detail the verses. وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And thus the way of the criminals will become evident. نُفَصِّلُ From the root letters فَا صَاد لَام فَصَلَ is to separate. To set apart. And فَصَّلَ يُفَصِّلُ Is to clarify, to elaborate, to detail something. In such a way that each point is distinct and separated from the other. To detail, to clarify in such a way that each point is distinct from the other. You know, sometimes you read something and it's written in one paragraph. And the other is that you read something and it's written in bullets. What's easier to understand? The one that is in bullets, in point form. So, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ Thus do we detail, meaning we clearly explain the ayat of the Qur'an. وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ Why? So that it becomes clear. تَسْتَبِينَ from the root letter is بَيَانُونَ Bayan is to be clear. Istibyan is to become evident. To become obvious. So that it becomes obvious what سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ The way of the criminals. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details all of these ayat so that the way of the criminals is clarified. Why? Why does he wish to clarify the way of the criminals? So that we don't go on that path. We don't do what they did. Okay, recitation of these ayat. They're a test for you. It's possible that everything could have been fine between you and them, but it's not. Why? Because this life is a test. So instead of saying, I don't like them, I don't want to see them, I want to be away from them, Allah put you in that situation and you are stuck to them. You have no choice. You have no choice. You are stuck to them. If you don't give them their haq, you are doing zulm. Know that they are a fitna for you and you are a fitna for them. Both of you are tests for one another. And Allah knows those people who are shakiri, who focus on the blessings instead of complaining about things that are not how they want them to be.